Hi. So uh, I'm a conservation biologist. And when I first heard about this whole concept of de-extinction, um, my initial reaction was of unmitigated horror. Uh, so I was instantly cast back, uh, cast into uh, the movie, of course. I'm playing Jeff Goldblum. I have the glasses, if any Jurassic Park producers are in the audience. I'm ready and willing to uh, step up. <coughs> there are some really good reasons why the conservation community are worried about de-extinction. And if I summarize the, the things that my colleagues have said to me over the past few months after learning I was coming here, they can probably sum it up to uh, these three kind of headings, kind of diversion, uh, invasives, and moral hazards. So diversion is diversion of, of conservation resources. So this, this could be well spent uh, with critically endangered species. There are very many. Uh, some of these new um, species um, that are being restored to long gone habitats, they could become invasive themselves and actually cause extinctions of other species. And also moral hazards, it's a, an idea which uh, Kent Redford has just be, uh, been uh, talking about in a new paper in PLOS Biology coming out in a few weeks, uh, that this might de-incentivize people for caring about the causes of extinction, the underlying causes of, of things going extinct, and also uh, people becoming de-incentivized to actually care about species, um, species extinction. Uh, so uh, my second reaction was one of uh, incredulity because you know, I listen to the British press, and the British press tells me that it's completely impossible. Uh, so this, is, uh, this is, not, is not possible. But you've been listening to the talks today, and um, OK, dinosaurs are probably not going to be possible, unless you make one out of a chicken. But, but um, I've been really blown away by uh, the progress and the, and the, the, the rate of advancement that's going on in synthetic biology. And so I guess my final reaction then is that not only is the extinction uh, possible, it's actually happening, whether the conservation community like it or not. So I think that now is the time for the conservation community to really, really engage and think of ways of interacting with the synthetic biologists and people who are de-extincting species so that we can really do it uh, with the best intentions and with the best results. So I think uh, having this negative reaction is understandable, but I think in the end we need to start to engage with and talk to synthetic biologists. So as, as a human species, we have been amazingly uh, efficient at, at making things extinct. So this is a, a slide showing uh, extinctions happening over the globe over the past 500 years. Um, so some, uh, so you know, iconic species that you know about already, like the dodo and the passenger pigeon, but also things uh, on many species on islands. Uh, my personal favourite is, of course, if anyone knows me, a bat. Uh, so this is a short-tailed uh, bat, which is uh, kind of flightless and uh, runs along the ground eating scorpions, or did. And of course, other things like the thylacine and the stellar sea cow, which is, is over here. So uh, given that there's been so many extinctions, how can we pick which species are more or less uh, uh, li likely to be good candidates for de-extinction? What, what are the criteria? So uh, let's think about the first thing um, that I think is the, the most important, which is having, uh, and people have talked about before, is having available habitats. And not only habitats that are presently OK, but also in the concept of global change with uh, land use change and, and climate change that are going to be suitable for the future. And also uh, that the threats which once threatened those species are now gone. So uh, let's give you a few examples then. Um, the Great Orc uh, is a very good example of something that we could bring back because its habitat is still there. And the threat, which was egg collection and hunting, is much less of a problem now. Now, on the other hand, uh, you've got something like amazing like the Baiji, the, the which is a Yangtze River dolphin, 
Uh, this species disappeared very recently, hasn't really, uh, has been last seen in 2004. It's not officially extinct yet, but more than likely is. Um, its habitat in the Yangtze River is uh, getting worse, not better, and there is no place for this species to go. So uh, having, uh, thinking about the habitats and the, the current threats, I think are going to be really important in deciding what species to bring back. Also, uh, another important criteria might be a viable, the size of a viable population that you'd need, and also their behaviours. So, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, but the passenger pigeon might be a bad candidate for this because it's got uh, very complex social behaviours and uh, the, the viable populations might actually have to be quite large, which may also become pests in themselves. Another example is a Stella sea cow. Uh, these are enormous species. They're uh, eight metres in length or were. Um, it might take an enormously long time to reach a viable population size. It might be extremely expensive. And both species are quite social, and, and bringing back social behaviour might be the, a really big challenge. So I think it's really critical that we start to engage with the co conservation community in much more, in a much more engaging way. And the, this, the kind of organization which has spent many years since 1960s putting, thinking about extinction and what makes species go extinct and classifying species along this kind of ladder of extinction from least threatened, uh, of least concern to uh, critically endangered is the IUCN. This organization um, has, has uh, drawn up lists of how, in, how at risk uh, species are across the planet. And perhaps we could think about how we can engage them to modify and maybe invert their categories and, and their uh, criteria, which is based on number of extant individuals and also uh, the existing threats, the nature of threats and, uh, and the amount of habitat left. Maybe we could do something with that criteria to come up with a new category on the red list, which could be candidates for de-extinction. So uh, what about the other side of this? So could we use the red list to help us, uh, to give us an idea of, of which species to bring back and using these synthetic, new synthetic biology techniques? So uh, this is a, a slide that's showing the proportion of, uh, of threatened species in each of these categories of this, of this ladder of extinction and talking about different kinds of, of groups of organisms at the bottom. So um, perhaps we could use these new synthetic biology techniques to move some of these species, these red, orange, and yellow species, into the green sections of, of, this, of this ladder. Another um, interesting uh, idea, and thinking about the criteria, might be uh, conserving evolutionary history. So uh, I'm giving you an example of a tree that uh, myself and some colleagues put together a few years ago now of all of the mammals. So here they all are. Uh, so if I just zoom in to one section of that tree, just here, and then expand that up uh, so that we have species on the left-hand side that have got enormously uh, long branches here, so they've got very few close relatives. So that means that area of red is uh, where that species has been evolving, uh, evolving by itself for a very long time, so it's very distinct. So the, in the example here, it's the echidna, which is an egg-laying mammal. So it is actually extremely distinct, and that's compared with species on the right-hand side, which have got close relatives. I've got nothing against rodents, by the way. There's just another example on there. Uh, so these species have got close relatives, so um, losing one of those species might actually not be such a big deal. So where would extinct species fit on that? Well, if you have a look at this, uh, the thylacine, as you heard earlier, is, is in a distinct, uh, it's very, very distinct, distinct family. And also, of course, I'll put the bat slide up, but this, this bat is extremely unusual. And it's, there's only two species in an entire family. So that, would, that means that these are very, very distinct, and they, they're actually on this side. The passenger pigeon and the orc are kind of on this side because they've got close relatives. So the importance of conserving evolutionary history has been recognized by the Zoological Society of London, 
And they have created a, a, a list of species which are not only critically endangered, but also evolutionary distinct. And they've called that the edge list, the evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. Uh, this is the edge list for corals, uh, which is just showing here. And many of those species are receiving little or no conservation attention at all. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, it may be that the synthetic biology techniques that we've been hearing about may not work very well with uh, species which have no close relatives. And so this edge list might be really helpful in trying to pinpoint those species which would be a real shame to lose, because we're losing so much evolutionary history uh, with the new synthetic biology techniques. So finally, then, um, maybe what we're doing here is, is not just trying to bring back extinct species and, and, and help critically endangered species, but think about it in a, in a more broader way, in a more innovative way. How could we use synthetic biology to understand and help conservation and looking at the actual underlying threats. And this is a slide showing a uh, white nose fungus, which is a, a disease uh, affecting uh, North American bat populations, uh, causing them to crash spectacularly. Uh, there's also problems with chytrid fungus, as we've been hearing about amphibians. Maybe synthetic biology could help us understand this uh, uh, fungus and make it less pathogenic or introduce alleles into these these species to help them overcome this threat. So just to end then, um, the planet is facing a huge crisis. And biodiversity is being lost at an astonishing rate. We need new tools to really get to grips with the underlying causes of biodiversity loss. And solutions that synthetic biology could help us with, like organisms to munch carbon out of our atmosphere or to grow, to grow uh, food for, uh, you know, a a population of 9 billion, which is predicted for the middle of this century. So I think there are other ways which synthetic biology could engage with conservation. So I think just to end then, um, I think that the conservation community needs to move beyond this initial negative reaction, this horror that I had, to thinking about new and innovative ways of engaging with synthetic biology and de-extinction. Thank you very much. Thank you.